Do you guys have a, a, a favorite family board game? Do you have a favorite board game? I, I know some folks aren't the board gaming, the board game type. You know, they'd rather watch Netflix or rather go for a walk or do something. But I, I love a good board game. Um, we uh, have you got how many Monopoly fans? Anybody? Any any Monopoly fans? Yeah. Does anybody absolutely dominate Monopoly in your family? Record streak unbroken, right? Um, has anybody played this game called Settlers of Catan? Is it is it Settlers of Catan or Settlers of Catan? Catan? Catan. All right, all right, all right. Have you ever had this experience playing a board game where you played it the same way year after year after year after year after year after year? And then somewhere along the way, somebody breaks out the rule book. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you experienced this? Third page over, fourth paragraph down, listen as I read the rules. And when they read how the game was designed to be played, it changes everything. Have you you ever had that experience? And sometimes it changes everything, and you're like, I hate this game. I'm never playing again. We've got our home rules. This is the way we play in our house. Like, who cares about the rule book? We've been playing this way for 10 years. We're not stopping the way we play this game. Is my family the only family that this happens to? I mean, I might be, like, over-dramatizing it a little bit, but, like, it's, there's some fury, you know, that flies when people read the actual rule book. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I want to show you a picture this morning, and... Um, if you've ever visited with me in my study, I may have showed you this before. But I, let, here's the first picture. I, I think that this picture, and so I, w- I want every 70-year-old, and I want every middle schooler, and I want every college student, I want every high school student, I want every, every young married couple, and I want every middle age, I want every one of you to get this. And I think if you get this, it, it, might, it might change things forever. Um, we, we, all, we all want to experience God's love and his acceptance. But many of us, we've been kind of playing the game, so to speak. It's a, life is not a game. But we've been living life as though we've got to obey to get into God's love. Some people might, might call it like a works-driven salvation. That, that what you do determines if you're loved. Now, many of us, we wouldn't say that we actually believe this. We wouldn't articulate it, but deep in our soul, we feel it. Deep in our soul, we would say, we may not believe it, but we experience it. And and what we experience is that somehow, how well I obey is going to determine whether or not I get into God's love, whether or not I experience God's love. Now, if this is the way you've been playing the game, if this is the way you've been living life, Here's the motivation that comes up. Look at this. Here's the motivation. Next slide. It's fear. That's the only motivation. Like, that's the only thing that can be in your heart. If you believe you've got to obey well enough to get into God's love. Now, why why do we end up in that place? Well, we end up in that place because we know in the Bible there's a ton of commandments, right? it's, It's just like the Ten Commandments. But you're like, there ain't just ten. When I read my Bible, they're like everywhere. They're like in every book. It's just like everywhere I read, there's like, live like this, don't do this, live like this, don't do this, live like this, don't do this. And it's like the Lord is saying, I'm creator, you're creation, I'm Lord, you're not, I'm going to tell you how to flourish. I've got the, and he tells us how to live. But somehow what happens is, is we think if we obey good enough, we'll get into God's love. And the only thing that can live in our hearts when that's the reality is fear. So if you're in that state, what's driving you is fear. What if I don't obey enough? I may not get into his love. What if I don't obey often enough, zealous enough? What what if my obedience doesn't outweigh my disobedience? The The only thing that can be living in your heart is fear. Unless you're like totally blind and arrogant and think that you like have obeyed God at every point, right? And then you're just, 
it's just kind of, I mean, blindly dumb, right? Because it's not hard to identify where we've fallen short, right? There's a, there's a, there's a better way that we're going to see that I think is the truth. It's like reading the rule book. Look at this next slide. This next slide, we see that at the cross of Jesus Christ, we understand we are loved. Not because of anything that we've done, but because God is love. He created us in his image. We're the pinnacle of his creation. He loves us because he wants to love us. The Bible says greater love has no man than this, and that he laid down his life for his friends. The book of Romans says it this way. But God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, not while we were really good at obeying him, but while we were yet sinners, on our worst day, on our worst year, in our worst life, God demonstrated his own love for us, and yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he didn't want us to doubt his love. He didn't want us to think that his mystery was a love that was hard to understand. He wanted us to understand we are loved, so he sent Jesus to die, to demonstrate, I love you this much. I'm going to give my only son to die in your place. Crazy. None of us would give up our children for somebody else. Like, no, but none of us would do that. This is like divine, sacrificial, mind-blowing, jaw-dropping love, right on? I mean, that's what, that's, this is the love of God. And so it's not because we're being afraid and trying to obey God, but at the cross, God said, it, you are loved. Whether you like it or not, I love you. <laughs> you think, whether you like it or not, why would you not like being loved by God? Well, we're pretty messed up people, aren't we? And some of us are like, no, I would prefer not to be loved because that's a little too vulnerable for me. <laughs> but we're loved, whether we like it or not. So the, the response to the reality that we are loved. We were, we were born as a loved creation of God. We lived all of our days as a loved creation of God. We're, we're loved. The response is that we obey. You see this? So it, it's, it's a response to his love. In other, in other words, we're not obeying to get into God's love, but we want to obey because we are loved by God. You see what comes first here? What comes first is that we're loved by God. In that our obedience is a response to God's love. So, right, the Bible's full of all these commands, right? Do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Well, how do we understand that? We don't understand it as we've got to obey to get into God's love. We understand it that, that no, at the cross, God demonstrated that we are loved. Period. Full stop. Loved by God. So our response is obedience, and it's not out of fear. It's out of what? Look at this. It's out of love. So we, so we obey God not out of fear that if we don't do it well enough, we're not going to be loved. We, we obey God because we are loved. We obey God because we want to. We obey. The, the core motivation in our heart is love. We obey God because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. And we love God because he loved us. It's a response to his love. Now listen, even the most seasoned Christians still bounce back and forth. <laughs> I know I'm loved, but I fall into this weird messed up belief that my love is dependent upon what I do, not upon who God is and what Jesus has done. But friends, this picture, go ahead and take out your phone and take a picture of this, because this, this picture in the truth that's found in this has the potential to set some of you free from fear forever. Let me just say that again. The reality of this has the power to set some of you free from fear forever. And some of you, listen, some of you need to take a picture of this so you can share it with a friend this week because they're on this never-ending hamster wheel of fear of I've got to do more, I've got to do it better, I've got to obey God. Oh man, I, I can't come to church because I'm not obeying God well enough, right? No, 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 no. You're loved. What, what do I have to do to, to earn his love? No, you, you are loved. So why do I start the sermon this way this morning? It's because in the sermon this morning, the Apostle Paul tells us a bunch of stuff to not do and a bunch of stuff to do. And if you hear it as though you got to do this stuff to get into God's love, you're, like, you're getting the whole thing wrong. You're getting the whole thing wrong. So I just wanted to start with like, let's read on page four, you know, page three, fourth paragraph down, the rule book. It changes everything. 
So let's look at it together in Ephesians chapter 4. Some, can somebody just say, Pastor, I get it. All right. You got it? I got it. But I need to get it tomorrow. And I need, I need to get it Tuesday. And it's not always easy to get it, is it? Sometimes we got it and we let go of it. So this morning we're all going to re-get it, right? Right on Ephesians chapter 4. Look at it with me. Verse 17. Rather, verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Let's pray and ask the the Holy Spirit's help to, to receive this and to apply it to our life. Father, we pray that in these few moments together, you would speak so powerfully that our lives would be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week I talked about walking through the trails in Rotary Park and I talked about coming to two different trails and we talked about taking the right path. Um, But as you walk through trails, what you often see is that there's roots, giant roots. You ever tripped over a root? You ever cussed at a root? You know what I'm talking about, right? There's rocks, there's giant rocks. You're walking on a trail, you're praying to God and then immediately you're like, how can I cuss in the middle of a prayer? That does not work, right? You're walking the trails, you trip over a rock. Um, If you haven't experienced it, Go walk on a trail, all right? So when I'm walking on a trail, there's roots that get in my way, there's rocks that get in my way, sometimes there's holes that get in my way. Do you know what I'm talking about? And so what we're talking about is as we walk through the path of life, there's things to avoid. There's rocks and roots and holes to avoid. And that's what Paul's saying. Paul's laying it out and he's saying, for the Christian, there's some specific things you are to avoid. And the first one is this, avoid lying by speaking the truth. Avoid lying by speaking the truth. Look at verse 25 with me again. Therefore, having put away falsehood. It's just another way to say, don't lie. Put put away falsehood. Now, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. So how do you avoid lying? You speak the truth. In, in, in other words, the way to avoid lying isn't don't lie, don't lie, don't lie. It's speak the truth. That, that's how you avoid lying is you, is you, you speak the truth. Uh, the reality is, is we can lie at all kinds of things, can't we? We, we can cheat on our test at school. That's, that's lying. We can cheat on our taxes. That's lying. You can lie on your resume. You can lie when you've done something wrong. I remember when I was a kid... Um, there was this bully on the bus, and I was getting off the bus, and um, I looked back, and he'd been bullying us the whole, he'd been bullying me the whole year, all right? And I turn around, and he's flipping me off out the window. You know what I did? I flipped him back off. Mm. And I go, and mom and dad were sitting on the porch. And I didn't know they were sitting on the porch. And they asked me if everything was okay and how the bus ride was. And did you have any problems? No. Everything was good? No. Everything was fine? No. You didn't have any problems? No. Did you, did you flip somebody off? No. <laughs> it takes like a millisecond to tell a lie, doesn't it? It like takes a millisecond. So how do we avoid lying? And tell the truth. Yeah, I flipped him off. 
flipped him off. Yeah, this is how much money I made this year. Yeah, I'm making a D because I'm not cheating on my test. I'm going to tell the truth about what I know about this subject. Yeah, I'm going to tell the, the truth. Avoid lying by speaking the truth. Now, what would motivate somebody to want to tell the truth? It's not to get into God's love. It's because we've been loved. In, in other words, this whole sermon series, we're talking about gospel roots lead to gospel fruit. And so, and so the gospel message isn't clean your life up. The gospel message isn't change your life. The gospel message isn't be good, be better. That's not the gospel message. That's not good news for anybody. The gospel message is you're loved. As unworthy as you are, you're loved. As sinful and rebellious as you are, you're loved. Let that touch your heart. Look at the cross and see that you're loved and let that reality change your heart. Let the Spirit of God touch you and begin to change you from the inside out. The, the Bible says God's the potter and we're the clay. Let God begin to mold you into who he wants you to be through his love, by his Spirit. So avoid lying by speaking the truth. That's a big root we got to avoid on the path. But we also have to avoid sinful anger by resolving anger. This is always, it's always funny to hear people talk about anger. People always debate it, right? Like people talk about anger as though it's a sin. And then other people are like, no, 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 Jesus got anger, angry. You know, he turned the, the tables over in the temple, you know. And it's always fun to hear people talk about like what's, good, what's righteous anger, what's acceptable anger, what's not anger. But here the apostle Paul is saying don't sin in your anger. Look at verse 26 and 27 with me. He says, be angry and do not sin. So, okay, okay, impossible. Thank you, I can be angry. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, I can be angry and not sin. Everybody's like, thank the Lord I can be angry and not sin. Well, look at what he says. Verse 20, 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Whoa. I actually think Paul means that. I, I, don't, I don't think Paul was giving an analogy I don't think Paul was speaking through poetry. I think Paul was saying, deal with your anger before the sun goes down today. I actually think he means that. And here's why. Here's why. God desires us to flourish. God wants us to flourish more than we want to flourish. And the apostle Paul knew that if we hang on to anger, we're not going to flourish. So he's instructing us on the best path. He's instructing us on the good way. He's in instructing us in the good life. And he says, listen, deal with it before the sun goes down because if you carry it into the night and you sleep on it and you wake up, you're going to wake up angry and that's no way to live. There's no joy in that. There's no peace in that. You're not, if you wake up angry, you're not flourishing. You're like downward spiraling if you wake up angry. So he says, he says be angry. Thank you. We can be angry. Thank you. But then he says, um, be angry and do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity for the devil. Now, most of us, if we think about anger and we think about like be angry and do not sin, we think, oh man, you can sin big time when you're angry, right? You can flip the guy back off, right? Been bullying me. I'm going to give it right back to him. Flip me off. I'm going to give it right back to him, right? We can do a lot of you can cuss somebody out being angry, right? You can raise your voice being angry. You can punch through a wall being angry, right? You can get revenge being angry, right? And, and a lot of times that's the way we think about sinning in anger. Have you ever asked the question, why am I so angry? Like you're just stewing on it, but have you slowed down long enough to Put your heart under a microscope and say, why am I so angry? Most of us would say, I know why I'm so angry. It's because this happened to me and it shouldn't have happened to me. There's a sense of injustice, isn't there? There's a sense of injustice. Friends, I've got good news for you. Listen to what Paul wrote in Romans. In Romans 12, 19 through 21, he says, beloved. Don't you love where he starts? Beloved. Never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The temptation in our flesh is that when we're treated unjustly, is to be angry, to seek vengeance. And God says, look, look, 
I've got a better way for you. You don't have to stew over the ang- anger, and you don't have to right the wrong. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take care of all of it. I'll repay it. I'll rep- I'm going to set the scales right. You don't have to. Hallelujah. That's freedom, friends. That's freedom. You don't have to do it. God's going to do it. He's going to take care of it. He sees everything. Last week we said he knows our thoughts. <laughs> God sees everything, and he's going to right every wrong. So we don't have to seek vengeance. But I want to submit to you this morning that um, there's another way that we sin in our anger. And one of the ways that we sin in our anger is, not, is, is essentially just avoiding conflict. It's avoiding conflict. In, in, other, in other words, many of us are afraid of conflict. We don't like it. Some of us are more messed up than that. We love conflict. <laughs> but many of us, we, we're afraid of conflict. We don't like it. We'd rather do anything than, than, than confront something or have conflict. Or, and, and so what happens is, is we get offended, we get hurt, we get angry, and because we, we hate conflict, we avoid it. Listen to me, listen to me. If you don't overcome the fear of conflict, you will turn into a bitter person. If you don't overcome the fear of conflict, you will turn into a bitter person. Because life is filled with hurt. Life is filled with miscommunication. Life is filled with sinful people, and we're going to hurt one another. The closer the relationship is, the deeper the hurt. We're, g- we're going to experience hurt. How it hurt turns into anger. The, Bi- the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. So if you can let it go and not be angry about how you're hurt, hallelujah, let it go. But if you're hurt and you're angry by it, if you're afraid of confrontation, you will turn bitter. And that's no way to live. That's not what God wants for you. That's not flourishing. That's that's not the beautiful life. That's not the good life. So if you avoid conflict on repeat, because I hate it, it's not pleasant, I break out in sweats, it's just the most uncomfortable thing, I lock up, it's all, you fill in the blank for you, you will turn bitter. Because you can't carry anger. You've got to resolve it. You've got to resolve it. Jesus in Matthew 18, he says, listen, if your, brother, if your brother has offended you, you go to him one-on-one and you talk it out. And if your brother can't hear you, you take another brother with you and you talk it out. And if you can't resolve the anger then, then you bring it before the church. Who wants to do that? <laughs> You're like, we're, we're going to resolve this before the sun goes down. Because we're not bringing this in front of everybody in the church, right? I mean, that's Jesus' design. He knew nobody wants to bring that mess up on stage in the church and say, all right, church, they can't sort this out. We're going we're gonna to help them sort it out, right? Nobody wants to do that. And Je- so Jesus gave really simple instructions. Go one-on-one, not a text, not a phone call, not an email, face-to-face, in the flesh. One-on-one. Why, why not an email? Because we can read the tones as they are unintended. Why not a phone call? Because you can't see body language. 86% of communication is body language. You've got to be able to see the way a person is postured, not just hear what they're saying. You've got to be able to see their face so you understand they really do want to resolve this. They really do want to put it. They're not seeking vengeance. They just want it resolved. So listen, how do you avoid sinning in your anger? You resolve it. And if you don't resolve it, you're sinning in your anger. And if you punch through the wall, you're sinning in, in your anger. And if you flip a guy off, you're sinning in your anger. And if you shout when you shouldn't shout, you're sinning in your anger. But if you don't resolve the conflict, you're also sinning in your anger. Church, do you see it? All right, so let's avoid sinful anger by resolving anger. We also need to avoid that big root, that big rock, that big hole. We need to avoid stealing by working and giving. I love this, verse 28, look at it with me. Let the thief no longer steal, but, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Don't you love the way Jesus transforms everything? <laughs> he, like, he speaks to the thief, and he's like, quit stealing, go to work, so you got something to give. It's like total transformation, isn't it? Listen, friends, Jesus will transform your life if you let him in today. 
Jesus will train. If you're a thief in this place, the spirit of God can change you. He can change your heart. He can give you a new heart. He can give you new desires. The spirit of God can change you today. He can turn you in from a, from a thief to a generous person. That's what Paul's expectation here. If you're a thief and you became a Christian, get to work. Make some money. Give it away. That's what he says. Quit stealing. Where are you stealing? Where are you tempted to steal? We can steal things everywhere, can't we? You can steal at the grocery store. You can take packages off people's front porch. You're like, that's why I'm angry, pastor. (laughs) Somebody took my package. You can steal supplies from your workplace. You can take equipment from the locker room. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. We can avoid stealing by working hard and giving away. This This is the good life, friends. This is what Jesus invites us to. We can avoid Next, we avoid rotten speech by speaking gracious words. Look at verse 29 with me. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. This is a hard one, isn't it? (laughs) He said, "Let let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Jesus, when, when we turn to Jesus, we turn to him as Lord. We turn to him as master. We don't, we don't just turn to Jesus as savior. We don't just turn to Jesus as the one who's forgiving us of our sins. We turn to Jesus as Lord. And what that means is, is we want to obey him. And we want to obey him not out of fear that we get into his love. We want to obey him because we're loved. And, and so when we turn to Jesus as Lord, we say, Lord Jesus, you've got the right to tell me how to talk. You've got the right to tell me what to say, what not to say, how to say it. And he's really clear here. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful for building up others. I mean, we got to stop sharing gossip in the name of a prayer request. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm just really concerned about them, so tell me everything about them. It's gossip, right? It's just corrupting talk, right? How can you use your words to build somebody up? You know what I love about this? There's no limit to the, account, the, the amount of encouragement you can give somebody. <laughs> like there's no alarm going off at 4 o'clock going, all right, you've encouraged too many people today. You've reached your encouragement limit. You've built too many people up with your words today. No, no, no. You can build people up from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed every day. You can use your words to build people up. And that's the beauty of the body of Christ. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, avoid rotten speech by speaking gracious words. When we were a kid, um, this was one of our memory verses one summer in the youth group. And so we, we memorized it. And um, the version we memorized it was, let no, un- let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful for building up others. And uh, this is really cool. Many of you know this, but a girl that I grew up with married this, this, this rock singer, and uh, this Christian rock singer. And, um, and they got married, and the Christian rock singer, like, he heard the story about the verse that they memorized growing up, and he named his band Building 429. Have you ever heard of that band? Like, it, like it's hard to have a band in Christian music, in the Christian music industry for 15 years, but, the, but Building 429 is still going strong. I, t- I texted him. He lives in Clarksville, and I texted him this week, and I said, hey, man, I'm coming, to, I'm coming to Ephesians 429. Can you be here? And he's like, I'm on the road every night this week. Sorry, I can't make it. But I just love that, that, that here's a, a verse, and like this verse is so relevant. It's so practical. Hey, no unwholesome talk out of your mouth, only that which is helpful for building up others. And here's a band, and they're like, we believe that. That's going to be our name. And, man, they're just going, and let's avoid rotten speech by speaking gracious words. And then finally, avoid grieving the Holy Spirit by making him glad in how you treat others. That's such a mouthful. <laughs> In, in preaching class in seminary, they would have said, you've got to shorten that, but, you know, avoid grieving the Holy Spirit by making him glad in how you treat others. Look at verse 30 to 32. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Like all, all the bitterness and wrath and anger that you have toward other people, when, when you carry that, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. You're making him sad. You're breaking the heart of God. When you carry anger, you're breaking the heart of God because he has something so much better for you. He said, put it all away and be kind. Verse 32, be kind to one another. 
You know, kindness is different than niceness. Do you know what I mean? Niceness is just this surface level, I'm not going to offend everybody. But kindness comes deep from the heart. It comes from a gospel root, and it comes out as a genuine fruit, kindness. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Let's don't grieve the Holy Spirit. In, in other words, the way we treat others, it's not just about our personality. It's not just about our habits. It's not just about how they get on our nerves. It's not just about, hey, this is just, just between me and them. You know, leave us alone. Like, we're okay. We, we, this is just us. No, you grieve God. You grieve God when you act that way. You break the heart of God when you act that way. And you don't have to. And what would make you not want to grieve the heart of God? Love. Love. Can we go back? To that final image. Here it is. So, so why would we want to be interested in telling the truth and not stealing and speaking words of kindness? Like, why would we want to be interested in that? It's because we're loved by God. It's because the very thing we need the most, God has given it abundantly. He's lavished it upon us, his love, his love. If you're here today, the greatest need you have is the pure, unadulterated, undeserved love of the divine. And he gave it to us abundantly through his son. And when that touches us, it begins to change us. And, and we avoid rotten speech and we start building up others. And we avoid telling lies by telling the truth. And we avoid carrying anger by resolving it. That's, that's what happens. And some of you know, listen, listen. I'm amazed when I see a new Christian who begins to walk in holiness quickly. <laughs> and sometimes I'm frustrated. Because you know? it takes a long time to do this, doesn't it? For some of us. In, in, in other words, the speed of spiritual growth seems to be different for everybody. Some folks, the Spirit of God touches their life and they're changed radically. In, in the Great Awakening, the stories that were told about when God showed up in our country during the Great Awakening, horses <laughs> quit responding to their masters because their master's speech was so dramatically changed. The horses were used to responding to loud shouts of profanity. And the Spirit of God fell upon the churches in our country and it began to change the speech and now they couldn't get their horses to respond because they had trained them with angry shouts of profanity. Some, sometimes when the Spirit of God touches us, the change is radical and deep and immediate. But for others of us, it's like, it's like planting a garden. It's slow. It's slow. It's slow. So today isn't like this high rung of the ladder saying measure up. It's just a reminder of what is God doing in us? What's God's plan and purpose in our lives? What, what is he doing? He's changing us into the image of his son. In Philippians 1, Paul wrote, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it under the day of Christ Jesus. So you may be frustrated at how quickly you're growing spiritually. God's not. He's not put out with you. He's molding you. He's shaping you. His purpose will prevail in his time. Cooperate with him today. Cooperate with the Spirit of God. Amen, church? Let's pray. Father, we need your help. Oh, God, we need your help. Lord, we're just such a mess. We're broken. We're so dysfunctional. We're so sinful. We're so foolish. But you are good. And you are wise. And you are loving and you are powerful. And we thank you that you do not leave us to ourselves. So we pray today that we would avoid these roots and avoid these rocks and avoid these holes. And we would do it. We would do it for the glory of your name, Lord. We do it for the glory of your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the last little verse. I don't want you to miss it because it just ties into the image. Verse 1 and 2 of chapter 5. Do you still have your Bibles open? If not, listen really close. 
Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. You see it? We're in his love. That's, that's why we're to imitate him. We're in his love. And walk in love. In other words, that's our motivation in our obedience. Walking in love. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? (laughs) What came first, our obedience or God's love? Well, if it's pure obedience, his love came first. If it's fear-driven obedience, then it may be obedience. But you don't have to try to obey out of fear. You can stop and rest in his love and then obey out of it. Amen, church? Amen, let's stand, let's sing.